Hey, hey, good morning to you, sir. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Of course, the vice president of player personnel for the Dallas Cowboys. You looking forward to getting these all these new guys up there at the star and out there on the practice field? Yeah, that's the best part about this deal is you go through and, you you know, it's the parcels deal. You got the groceries now. Let's see what we can make out of the groceries. So Tristan Hill, your guys' second-round pick, was one that we heard the name a lot leading up to the draft and leading up to you guys being on the clock at number 58. What was it about him in that spot that made you guys think this has got to be the first guy we pick? Obviously, I'm sure that not thinking he'll be available later is a part of it. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you have a player that you that fits your system, that um, fits your culture, that uh, has a, as a young player has an opportunity to grow, and um, we feel like develop into a very, uh, very, very good player uh, for the Cowboys, uh, you want to go get him. Um, you know, and, and, and you look at the draft, and you we have a draft board that's based on our uh, individual rankings and grades and then we put our board together for us and he had a great value for us there what i know this is maybe a little bit different for every team but i feel like people debate the term best player available all the time how much goes into who gets selected when you get on the clock um, it's a combination of best player available and position to need i mean the the nfl is made the, 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 with the with the salary cap and everything, it's for everybody to be 500. You know, everybody spends the same money and everybody kind of uses the same process. But now, as you put together your individual board and your information, it's for you and it's how you find the right players to fit for you within your system for now and for the long term. So we look at it both ways. It's the best player available and position of need. So it's a combination of that as we put together a board and that we pick our players. It's the vice president of player personnel, the Cowboys, Will McClay, with us. Were there safer players uh, that you could have taken there at 58 as far as probabilities that you get a hit? And, and how does positional value play into that? Um, you know, positional value. I mean, we look at it. There's a lot of analytics and do all that stuff when we talk about the, uh, the systems that we run and the value of players in those systems. So if you look at uh, value and best player available, when you talk about putting those players into a system – the three technique, as our uh, defense is constructed, is a very valuable piece for all those things to run. So that value might be higher on our board than it is for somebody else, or in our eyes than it is for somebody else. We're making our board and putting values on players based on the exercises that we do and based on you know, how valuable each player in position is to our team. So – Help us out with leading up to this, the years leading up to this. It is a very important position. It didn't feel like you guys had spent the 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 assets in free agency or the draft that kind of reflects that. Why hadn't there been an opportunity be- before now to spend this kind of draft capital at that three technique? No, because we have guys and we develop them, and there's other – as you put together a team, there's other parts, and we felt like we could, at the right value – add something to the defense to allow us to uh, be successful, which we have defensively, and it's grown as we're building the different pieces. Each team's not built in a day. It's built over the course of time and how you spend those resources. Uh, We went out and we did some things, and we got players that played well for us at that time at that level. Uh, You know, we had David Irvin, who we got off the street, who when he was available was a very valuable three technique. We've moved players around and kind of orchestrated our deal to be able to function as we continue to try to get better. When you guys got into the third round there, tell us about the Connor McGovern pick and what that was like in the room, because I feel like he may have been towards the top of the board, if not at the very top of it. Was was a guard consideration going into it, or was it just a scenario where you said, guys, this is it. He's our best guy. we got to take him. It was a scenario that was that was the best player on our board, and that's when – uh, now, at times when things happen and, and, and as the draft goes, different teams pick different players and that, you know, they take away from, you know, your like there were guys that were picked that may have been on our board in the fourth round or third round that were picked in the first or second round. So that kind of changes the, the view of your board. Well, when you look at it, OK, we're in the third round. Yeah, we have players in the third round, but it's. Jason said, and you hear it in the, heard in the press conferences, there was that blinking red light. We have learned our, our, our lesson and gone through and say, okay, if there's something that's there that's just 
that valuable, uh, then that's when you go with the best player available, and that's why how we pick Connor. I've always wondered about this. If when you when you rank your players and you put to bo- your board together, is there any thought of considering the positional value going in, and then just kind of having them in that order? Like instead of putting Tristan Hill where you've graded him as a player, but put him in the order of this is how we'd pick him, so that he's right at the top when you get there. No, no, that's that that's that you know, in our estimation way to do it's the wrong way to do it because then you don't you have to value players when we go through the process. It's who is, you know, when you talk about best player available, it's you have to sequence it that way from the all the work that we've done, who do we place the highest value on as the best player in this draft and then go down from there. Because if you don't do that, then you put need before value and you know you don't want to reach for need. Uh, that's our, our kind of idea. If you put them all the way that uh, that you feel that they are at the level as a player, then you don't reach for need. Then you, you know, you're more than one player away. So if I stack these guys and if a great player falls down to us at the second pick, well, we'd, we'd be crazy not to consider that and to be aware of it. It's Will McClay here with us, Cowboys Vice President of Player Personnel. The picking of the two guys that play running back, what can you tell us? Uh, th- is that a signal of anything? Are we going to see some new looks, getting two guys out on the field together, or were you just asked to you know, address that position with talent? No, I, you know, again, we're, we're, we're looking at players that can add something to our team uh, and offensive and defensive systems, and the great ones are, are, are made with, by designing your scheme or using the players that you have within the scheme, not trying to necessarily, especially offensively nowadays, not trying to fit a specific player into a scheme. It's if we have these things at our disposal, uh, we have great coaches that are going to be able to use those. And um, Tony Pollard is an explosive space playing guy with the way the game is played now. He could add some value there. Mike Weber will come in and compete and see if we can strengthen that room uh, the strength and the depth of that room, um, you know, so that if something does happen or we, you know, use a different strategy, we got pieces to take advantage of that. Will, what's the cutoff on where it doesn't matter how bad they are in training camp, they're on the team when you draft a player? Is it after the third round? Is it after the fourth round where, look, we drafted them, they're on the team, it doesn't matter how bad they look? Um, I don't think that's – I mean, you, you look at it, you're making an investment, and our job in scouting is to get, you know, as high a return we can get on as low of, you know, on the investment. Um, if there's a guy that uh, isn't performing, he's not good enough to be on the team, we have to be grown enough to say, well, maybe, you know, if there's something developmental in there, it takes a little bit more time. And if not, we, we have to be willing to move on. And that's, you know, the NFL is Darwinism. It's, you know, it's, it's you know, the survival of the fittest. So, I can't de- determ- make a determination and say, okay, if he's drafted in the first round, he's on the team. Relatively speaking, you've made that investment in him, and you hopefully you've done it right. If you hadn't done it right, uh, you know, I wouldn't be here for too long if we had a bunch of first-round picks that couldn't play and we lost that investment. So, we, you know, we want to try and make sure that we get a good return on that investment. Can you take us inside the room when it gets to the third or fourth or maybe even fifth round if Rod Marinelli's got a guy he likes, you've got a guy that you and the scouts like, Jason Garrett or Kellen Moore has a guy that he likes. How does that play out while you're on the clock, or does most of that get worked out before you get there? Uh, A lot of it's worked out before we get there, but, again, you don't know how players are coming off, so that comes the, the, the statement of trusting your board. We look at it, we value guys that, uh, and our overall board that are from all different positions, and we look at what best fits the situation. Um, again, it comes down to now when you start getting in that round, a lot of it is, uh, you know, when you start looking at needs, but you consider the best player available because you're not one player away. Going back to the Connor McGovern deal, it's like well, people say, well, you didn't need a guard. Well, that's the best player available, and based on what happened to us last year, with Travis, you know, going through what he went through with some of the injuries and things that happened, if we can keep our strength strong and it's the right value, we'll we'll do that. So when when you guys are looking at contracts that are or aren't coming up and factoring that into your draft needs with Connor McGovern, 
and with Connor Williams having contracts that go longer than Lyle Collins' contract, for instance, are we going to see Connor Williams take any snaps, at least in OTAs or practices, at tackle, or do you just move forward this this year as is? I think we're going to um, use our players to be versatile to handle the situations this year, and then that will give us some insight into where we go. Lyle Collins is ours. We love him. Uh, but there's the business part of football that you at least have to be prepared for, and if you're prepared for it, then you will make better decisions when those times come, uh, as opposed to not having an answer and maybe doing something that may affect you long term. We want to at least be in a position so we can uh, make the right decisions to have an opportunity to be successful for a longer amount of time. Who are a couple of your favorite, either day three or even the undrafted free agent guys that you brought in that are kind of dark horse chances to make the roster? You know, I really uh, like because of what we have in here coaching them is we brought in Chris, Chris Restry from, um, from Kentucky. I mean, he's got rare, unique um, physical size and athletic ability. Can we get it out of him? He's a 6'4 corner that runs a 4'3 with 33-inch arms. And uh, within the system, I think he has an opportunity to come in and compete to see if he can add something to this roster. Uh, we, uh, Daniel Wise is a guy that uh, is local and from here, and he plays our kind of way. Can he bring something to us? I think we have uh, we we got some uh, free agent offensive linemen that, again, have the ability to, if they can develop, give us depth as you go through this. And we got a couple of young receivers, I think, can uh, uh, have some NFL abilities too, and John Bay Johnson, uh, Jalen Guyton. So there are some some guys within that deal, and we've got uh, four um, undrafted free agent linebackers that all have traits that we like. We want to get the best players through the seven rounds of the draft and then college free agency to um, make this thing competitive. And, and we truly feel like if it's competitive from top to bottom, you're going to have a good team and you're going to have depth to survive, to survive the NFL. You think about the Redskins and, you know, they would bring in a guy on Tuesday to play on Sunday when they were decimated with injuries. So as much as we can strengthen this roster uh, with, you know, within the salary cap and all that stuff to, to be able to uh, put together a team that, that, that can withstand the, the rigors of an NFL season, that's kind of what we're trying to do. Will McClay with us. Uh, we were talking with the Travis Frederick and Sean Lee about this at our Mud Bug Bash a couple of weekends ago. You just said the phrase top to bottom, and I, I wonder from your perspective, top to bottom, is this the most talented roster that you guys have built out there at the Star? Um, I, I think that we, we, we have a lot of really, really good players um, that um, all have to uh, play to the level of their ability. It's to the coaches to get it out of them, and it's to those players that if we – got the right kind of people with football character that they'll achieve that. But I do feel like we've got a pretty strong team now, um, and it's, 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 it's very talented. How close is what would be your second offensive line to being as, as good as some of the starting offensive lines that are out there? I mean, there's tremendous depth along this offensive line in particular. Will, do you agree with that assessment? Yeah, yes, I do. And I think, you know, again, we, we started out to build it that way because if the – you know, it all starts with the front. It's, it, it, it starts if, if we can protect and we can uh, create lanes for a running back to run and for the quarterback to throw to our receivers, those guys, those stars that we know, those guys that we wear their jerseys, they will be better. Defensively up front, if we can stop the run and get after the passer, now the corners, the linebackers, and the safeties will be better at their jobs. So, you know, and there's a lot of teams in the NFL that might have one or two offensive lineman we feel like we got seven or eight who is the guy in the war room that is the most intimidating to go to war against when it comes to who's going to be picked with a pick um jerry <laughs> i mean <laughs> <Okay. laughs> you know he, he he listens to us and he takes that information in and we build it all together and and and, and he wants to know what he's getting so it can be intimidating from a standpoint that uh, you want to make sure, and our job in scouting is to give him the right information to take what we get from the coaches as to what they're looking for, uh, look at all the things in the background, the intangibles or whatever, and say, this is why we believe in this guy. Can you confirm this story for me, Will, that uh, Tristan Hill, the second-round pick, spent his 21st birthday talking defense with Rod Marinelli in a hotel room? Yes, yeah, it was um, – 
you know, Rod said he was going to go down there and we were going to work him out and he, we were made, he was making the swing. Uh, and part of what we try and do is match the player with the coach. And uh, when you turn on the tape, you go, boy, Tristan's got Rod stuff. I mean, we hear it every day. He is he is very, very much into what he is looking for, and he knows he's done it such a long time. So uh, he went out to go work him out, and the workout was the next day, and it was Tristan's birthday, and Rod said, well, you know, if you want to, you come hang out with me. And the kid was so excited to have the opportunity to hang out with Rod and talk football and do all that. You don't find very many 21-year-old uh, guys that are turning 21 in Orlando, Florida, that want to hang out with Rod Marinelli on their birthday. Oh, that's a, that's a great sign, sir. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys.